The Composite Bridge Wizard is aimed at steel concrete composite structures where the deck slab and girder webs will be modelled as shell elements with the girder flanges, stiffeners and bracing modelled as beam elements. In this model, which is in units of kilopounds and feet, I have predefined one geometric cross section and a couple of materials which will make things a little bit faster when introducing new facilities. The composite bridge wizard can be found under the bridge menu where there are various entities to be defined in order to construct your bridge. We'll start off with the cross section. We're going to have two cross sections on this structure. One is going to be suitable for mid-span sections and the other one over the piers where we're going to have an increased thickness on our flanges in order to cope with the increased bending moments. Our structure has a width of nine feet of slab contributing to each girder. Obviously in a realistic structure, the cantilever on the external girders would be less than half the spacing of the internal girders. But for simplicity of this demonstration, I'm simply using the same girder in all locations. As I'm working in feet and inches in this model, I can either simply type in the number where the dimension is in feet or add the inches sign where the dimension is in inches. So this section is our mid-span section. The pier section only varies in a couple of dimensions in that it has thicker flanges. The next thing to define is a girder which specifies the longitudinal positions at which each cross section is used. So for our first span we're going to be starting with our mid-span section at the start and then at 64 feet along the span is when we change to our pier section. The interpolation, we're going to be going with a step interpolation, which allows a sharp change in the cross section. So this is going to be our span one girder. For span two, we're going to be starting with the pier section. At 20 feet, we're going to be changing to the mid-span section. And then at 80 feet, changing back to the pier section. Next we need to define our spans, which is going to specify how many and of what type of girder we have adjacent to each other in each span. So for span one, we're going to have four of the span one girder. If we'd done a different external girder, we'd probably want to mirror it about the web on one side so that we only have to define one external girder and can have the cantilever the correct side. Similarly for span 2, we're going to be using four span 2 girders. We now need to define our supports. We're going to have two different types of support in this structure. We're going to have a guided support, which allows longitudinal movement. And we're also going to have a fully fixed support, where the longitudinal movement is fixed. We can now define our actual bridge layout. We're going to bridge, and we're going to have span one, 80 feet, then span two for 100 feet, and then the final span, span one, is again 80 feet long, but this time we're going to reverse span one in order to make sure that our pier section is at the start of the span rather than at the end. In terms of our setting out, we're going to be curving to the right using a mesh side of 2 and our radius is 600 feet. Support 1, 2 and 4 are all guided with this fixed support at pier 3. And that's now enough information for Lusas to generate our bridge. We can see on plan our curve setting out as we defined. We can see we've got our longitudinal support at this pier only. And we can see the positions at which the cross section has changed between the mid span section and the pier section. If we turn on fleshing, we can see the rendered dimensions of all of the members that we've defined. We have shell elements for the slab and for the girder web. Beam elements are currently only being used for the flanges. What we want to do now is to add in our stiffeners and our cross bracing. 
These can of course be defined through the same wizard menu. For our transverse stiffener, we have an outstand of 8 inches, thickness of half an inch, an offset of zero. And this one is going to be for the left hand side of the web. And we'll make a similar one for the right. Our transverse bracing is going to be K bracing. We can define this again by going through the same menu. So using the cross section that I previously defined and the material. Our first member is going to go from the top of the web of the left girder to the bottom of the web at the midpoint. We're then going to go from the bottom of the web at midpoint to the top of the web of the right girder. And then we need to go across the bottom. And this will be our K bracing. The left hand stiffener is going to be on the right of the left hand girder, and the right hand stiffener is going to be on the left web of the right hand girder. Obviously we could have different bracing types in our model, this is just a simple one with the same bracing type everywhere. We then need to define where this bracing appears, so we're going to use it at each support between every single pair of girders. And we're also going to need it within the spans, which can be done through an intermediate bracing one. In the first span, we're going to need one every 16 feet. And then the second span is going to be every 20 feet. Although I've called those bracing runs span 1 and span 2, they're not currently linked to the actual span definitions. So if we go into the span definitions, we can then select the appropriate bracing. We've now defined all the additional information we need. The only thing left to do is to regenerate the bridge structure. When we do this, the previous geometry will be deleted and replaced by our new geometry. Now if I turn on fleshing and rotate the structure, we can now see that we have intermediate stiffeners and in transverse bracing connecting them together. So the wizard has generated our geometry for our model. We still need to assign any loads that we wanted to. Let's just for a quick demonstration assign self-weight to the structure and solve. Here we can see the deformed shape of the structure showing that the structure is behaving exactly as we would expect. With the type of model we created, we currently get separate results for the slab, for the web, for the top flange and for the bottom flange. Probably what we'd actually like is a bending moment on the entire compound section. We can do this using the slice resultants facility. If we go to the groups tab of the tree view, we can see that Lucet has automatically created some groups for us. If we set the girder span lines as the only visible, then we are able to see the center line of each girder. If we select that for girder 1, for example, we can then use this as the center line for our compound section. If we go to utilities, slice resultants, beam shells, we'll go for a constant spacing of, say, 10 feet, and we'll define a slice width of 9 feet because we only want to pick up any elements that are within 4.5 feet either side of this center line we've defined. Call it at a one. And we can see these red rectangles defining the extents of each of these slice positions. If we go back to make everything visible again, turn off the deformed mesh, we can now turn on a bending moment diagram 
and select it for beam shell splice resultants. In order to see the composite bending moment of all of the elements that make up girder 1. We could of course do a similar thing for girders 2, 3 and 4.